Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE11. frame rate don't pick a fight don't look it in the eyes this is the show that thinks you should be able to watch the stuff you want when you want where you want and on whatever damn device you please and we're aiming to help you do just that i'm tom merritt hey man i'm brian brushwood and that my friend was the internet very upset about the google plus integration i don't know if you noticed tom apparently apparently like dealing with trolls and hateful racism on YouTube and cr trying to create a civil environment, apparently it's worse than Hitler. It is. It is. Uh, they have decided on the YouTube comments section, which we all know is a paragon of free and open expression for anyone who wants to curse or call someone gay. Uh, you <laughs> now have to sign in with a Google Plus account. And you know what the problem there is, Brian? You have to use your real name. Not everybody wants to use their real name in a YouTube comment. No, Not everybody I, I wants to have a Google a, Plus look, account. That's just, that's, that's just more fascist propaganda, my friend. Because look, uh, half of my friends on Google Plus clearly are not using their real name unless Jeff Fantastico is this guy's actual real name. Look, I, I, okay, so real quick, real quick. The whole thing is people are, what's funny is people are howling because there's change, right? Every time, you know, there's petitions like, bring back the old Facebook. We like the old Facebook. Uh, here's the problem. YouTube comments were utterly and completely broken. You would, as a content provider, sooner take paper cuts to the eyeballs than read YouTube comments, and it was this ugly, ugly slog that you had to go through over and over and over again. They eventually uh, uh, came up with the idea of, of, hey, we should revamp the commenting system so that there's a persistent history, and so that if somebody has a history of being a troll and having downvoted comments that are just ugly and hateful, then maybe those uh, that reputation would precede you and your comments would be less likely to be viewed. Brilliant idea. Then they said, hey, we already have a largely complimented uh, generally liked commenting system on Google+. Plus. We'll just integrate it with Google+. Plus. And then they integrated it and the whole world exploded and started calling Google Hitler. Um, now, keep in mind, keep in mind that I have no place to talk. You should not believe anything that I say because I stand to personally benefit from it because I have a lot of Google+, Plus followers. So, uh, so probably everything I say is because I'm a shill for Google. But me personally, not a fan of the hateful, homophobic racism that used to rule Google uh, or YouTube, and I'm really excited about the changes that they're making. Uh, to be fair, though, they could have dealt with this without making people use Google Plus accounts if they wanted to. Uh, they were already down that path. It's that Google wants to have all of that information piled up in one neat stack that they can sell to advertisers, which is why they want you to do a Google Plus account. Frankly, if they'd done this and said, it's not a Google Plus account, it's the new YouTube commenting, but it was really Google Plus on the back end. Yeah. There would have been less freak out. They should have talked to Blizzard, though, because it's all about the real name. Blizzard tried to make real names on their forums a while back, a few years ago, and had exactly the same uproar uh, and ended up changing their policy again. But then again, my wife works for YouTube. So don't take any <laughs> Both of us. Don't, don't, don't listen to either me or Tom. We are clearly shills for corporate America. But you know who's not a shill for corporate America? It's Twit's very own Scott Wilkinson. Are you there with us, Scott? <laughs> I am <laughs> hardly a shill for corporate America, but uh... <laughs> oh, oh, but he is no! also he is a hater of Skype right now because he just froze no. <laughs> froze up on him. Well, that's just it. It's, with him. it's his I controversial do, comments. Uh, a computer restart. So 
It's good. It, well, I'll tell you what. You go ahead and restart your computer, Scott. We'll go ahead and jump in with the big story. And Scott Wilkinson will join us Please. already in progress. When the big but story. But first, we'll fade to black and just hang progress. out. Stop everything. It's another big story. That was a moment of silence for Scott Wilkinson as he restarted <laughs> his computer. Connection. Yes. That was, that was not a, a mistake. <laughs> I mean, it's good. Totally it's intentional. Glad. I'm glad we yesterday got that is not when this happened, but that's what they say on the IO9 story. Uh, so I suckered, I got suckered in. Uh, this was on Thursday that Marvel announced a partnership with Netflix to make not four, but five new Marvel series. One about Daredevil, one about Luke Cage, one about Iron Fist, and one about Jessica Jones. And then a mini series is the fifth one that will bring all of them together in one amazing heroic uh, miniseries, all of this coming to Netflix even before the exclusive deal between Disney, who owns Marvel, and Netflix begins. Uh, so what do you think, Brian Brushwood, of original Marvel, admittedly not A-list superheroes coming to Netflix? Uh, okay, first of all, understand that um, less than A-list superheroes is very fertile ground because that is where you can afford to take very big risks. And Netflix is a company that has prided itself on taking very big risks with everything from House of Cards to uh, Orange is the New Black. You know, they're, they're trying ambitious, crazy things. Um, th to be honest, I, I, I like to think that I'm the kind of person who, and keep in mind, I'm a Marvel kid. Ever since eighth grade, it's been all Marvel comics for me. Uh, I was never crazy about Power Man and Iron Fist. I was never crazy about Daredevil. I mean, it's like his power is that he's blind. Okay, that's weird. Uh, and uh, and and to be honest, I hadn't even been following Jessica Jones. And so, like, these four titles, I didn't really understand the appeal of it. This io9 article did an exquisite job of making a very good case for why this is not only a win for Marvel, why it's also a win for Netflix, and most importantly, it's a win for fans of the genre because uh, they... Uh, this is something you never get to do in television. Yes, you get to do it if you're going to do a planned miniseries, maybe one. Uh, yes, you get to do it when you're making movies and you hope that certain movies will be success and they'll eventually tie in. Obviously, we saw Marvel killed it with all laying all the groundwork that led up to the Avengers. And the Avengers was exquisite. It was amazing. But in the world of television, you know, they're pointing out that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. almost didn't happen. And, and uh, the response it got... Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. not only needed to please comic book fans, it needed to please housewives in middle America who had never heard of any of these characters or this organization or whatever. Uh, and the fact that there's a huge difference between this is not something that got optioned, this is not something that was being in talks or in development or being worked out. Netflix wrote a check and says, yes, we'll take five. Four of them that all lead up to a fifth. This is the type of storytelling that we have never seen before. And well, it's the type of thing, if, if they bring half the quality they brought to House of Cards and to Orange is the New Black, this is going to be the best comic book television we've ever seen. This well, is, but they, I'm here, super here's the excited. Key. Here's the key, Brad. They didn't bring quality to House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. They recognized and allowed quality to happen by right. those directors and production companies. And what they're doing with Marvel, we have seen before. We've seen it on the big screen. Because what I think they're trying to do here, and we'll see if they can be successful, is replicate the, we're going to make an Iron Man movie, and then a Thor movie, and then a sequel right. Iron Man movie, and then a Captain America movie, and then we're going to bring them all together in the Avengers. On a much smaller scale, obviously, they're going to say, here, let's go, let's take the stronger of the second tier characters that nobody else will take a flyer on. Let's allow you to know I'm going to have 13 episodes. I can cross over whenever I want because the audience is going to be able to watch these whenever they want. I don't have to worry about some TV executive wading in at the last minute and rescheduling something and screwing it all up. And then... I can build to a climax miniseries that brings all those plot lines together. And they can even go further from that. They can start populating these guys in a, Rob, uh, uh, Rob Bricken has a theory on io9 that, you know, maybe these will tie into the movies down the road with, by setting up certain plot lines that involve, I think, Thanos and, and some other people. So this is really interesting. Scott, I think we got you back. Uh, we I don't do. know if you're, you're a big Marvel fan or not, uh, but I know you've seen some of these movies. What do you think about Marvel coming to the Netflix screen? I think it's a great thing. I, I have seen quite a few of the Marvel movies, most of them probably, um, and I'm they do a pretty good job for for being comic book, uh, you know, 
pretty straight ahead comic book type content. And uh, boy, bringing it in, uh, you, what you just said is exactly right. You know, it, it really opens Scott, up a, a wide range of possibilities. Yes. I love you deeply, which is why I'm going to give you the racist uncle pass for saying that they're good for being comic book movies. I'm going to pretend <laughs> you didn't say that. I'm just going to pretend you just said they were good and you didn't qualify them for being comic book movies. Uh, no, I thought they were. I thought they were exquisite. But um, uh, one of the things that they bring up is that because all of these will be in production at the same time, and because they could tell a story uh, theoretically, if we're if they're going to do a fifth series that's all about how it all comes together, um, you know, there could be crossover moments that lead up to this. Uh, it's it's extraordinary, man. It's it's a good time to be a comic book geek and and see what they're doing. And don't forget, uh, we, I don't know if I mentioned it, 2015 is when these will hit Netflix. So these are this is the announcement. And just like House of Cards, it took us a year or so before we finally saw it get produced, you know, get edited, posted, and put up on Netflix. 2015 is when this will come. And Disney's deal for movies follows in 2016. Uh, so imagine, you know, you, you roll these out in 2015, 2016, you start bringing all the Marvel movies to Netflix, possibly, given that, uh, yeah, given that wow. deal there. Well, and, and you know what's funny is is on the one hand you look at this and and it's oh I see what you did there. Uh, on the one hand, it would be remarkable to see this all happening, but on the other hand, all they're doing is what the original Marvel Universe experience was like for comic book nerds. They're just bringing that to uh, you know to to a different medium. That that was what was always great about comic books is that you had crossovers. You had characters show up one. You had a story begin in one place and and sure. get referenced in another place and then close in another place. Uh, the fact that they're that they're that they're doing what has already worked for comics and just making it translate to another medium. And that's the other thing that you could not have done this in the world of of primetime television. Uh, and the example io9 was the one that pointed out like uh, Buffy and Angel were out at the same time. And they had difficulty writing stories that started one and ended on another because they figured out that the crossover wasn't necessarily there. People who were watching Angel didn't necessarily watch Buffy, and that was complicated. Whereas they, they pulled don't it have to off worry about a couple that. times. But you're right; it was always like, oh, "We did it! We we tricked the world by making this happen." Not right. It's built in. It's part of the way we're going to produce these because. A, we know we have a full season of all four of these characters and a miniseries at the end, and it's all bought and paid for. It's not going to get canceled yeah. at some point. A huge difference. Let's uh, let's 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 let the folks in on another big story, shall we? Stop everything! It's another big story. What's the cheapest way to get HBO in the United States of America? Tom, you may say, that's a two-week-old story. I'm a devout follower of Frame Rate, and you talked about that already on episode 146. Uh, well, it's still in the news because we talked about the Comcast bundle that gave you basic television channels and an internet connection and HBO for $40 a month. The uh, folks at The Verge did a nice little breakdown of what the hidden fees are, what the what the second year cost for that, because you got $17 a month in hardware rental fees on top of that $40, by the way. Uh, and then they compared it to others. They looked at Verizon Fios, they looked at AT&T UVerse and Google Fiber uh, and Bright House to say like, okay, if you wanted to just get the basic channels plus an internet connection in HBO, what would it, what would it cost you? Comcast is definitely the cheapest with this bargain version. When you get to the second year, they're still the cheapest, but their Cox starts to get a little more competitive. Uh, and they're definitely not the cheapest on hardware rental fees. And then right along with that, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about uh, how one of their uh, one of their writers was able to call up Verizon. Uh, he was going to cancel his television service, and it was he basically did the chicken challenge. He probably doesn't know he did it. Uh, but Martin Pierce, their marketing editor. Said, got, said, I want to cancel television. And they said, hey, how about if we knock your rate down from $85 a month for internet to $80, or was it 90 to 85 anyway, uh, and keep the 20 basic channels, right? Yeah. So they essentially are yeah. paying him to keep the basic channels. He said, yes, why not? And then called him back in a while and said, hey, now that I get the basic channels, does that mean I can add HBO? And they're like, yeah, we'll give you an introductory offer, $10 a month for a year. So they're essentially $5 a month. He's getting HBO with his internet connection. 
Yeah, and it's not just him because we actually got an email. I'm going to pinch something out of the feedback segment yeah, please here. Do. Uh, Will wrote us saying, Hi, Brian and Tom. Wanted to share my inadvertent chicken challenge. I currently have standalone Comcast internet. I call in to tell them to change my speed. I was actually planning on giving them more money. The customer service rep did the challenge for me and instead set me up with a faster speed at a price that was lower than I was already paying if I was willing to take basic cable. It just goes to the point that they seem to want to be able to count cable TV subscribers. Uh, and that's from Will. Uh, yeah, man, it, it looks like they're so, I mean, I hate to say desperate, but so desperate to to keep their numbers, to to kill the story that the world is leaving the uh, cable in droves. Scott, have you tried the chicken challenge yet? Or, or you do, you know, have you called your cable provider and threatened to cancel? No, I haven't, but it's a good idea. I might, I might in fact, just try to do that. I, I, what do you Man. think of this idea? I mean, how many people will it take to do this before they st before it doesn't make sense? Because right now what they're thinking is, well, if we're already giving them a connection with an internet connection, the marginal cost of switching the, the computer to say, go ahead and let them have some basic television channels is almost zero, uh, but it right. beefs our numbers up. Right, exactly. I was going to say, first of all, that I don't really have cable anymore. I use cable internet, but I don't have the... Uh, okay. uh, the TV or the phone service, because I use direct TV for my broadcast per se. But, uh, you know, people are leaving cable in droves. And so they're trying to find some way to shore up their numbers. And, and I guess this is one way to do it. Yeah, it's harder. Yeah. I'm in the same situation where I have direct TV along with a different internet provider. I guess if mm -hmm. I called up my internet provider... I couldn't do this because I've, I've got I've got to have the FIOS. But uh, if I called them up and said, "Oh, I, I want to cut my my internet account," maybe they might offer me higher speeds and television to try to entice me in or something. Sure, like. sure. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, you know, every, every time you do that, it, if you're going to cancel something, they're going to say, "Oh, well, how about if we add this or how about if we add that?" You know, stay, please, stay, please. We need your we need uh, we need drugs on the table. We need to juice the stats. <laughs> We need, we need to numbers. look at the papers. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's take a uh, quick break then and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com. Brian, have you seen their television ads? Whoa. Whoa. I have. Television? I have. Are, 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 are they They're on Hulu. On us? They're on Hulu as well as broadcast and cable television. That's right. What are they saying? They're saying... They're they're beautiful. They're like these. They're like Apple ads. They they show like these well designed people living well designed <laughs> lives. Uh, well designed. Actually, people. They don't really show the people. They just show like their desktops, right? So it's an artist or it's somebody working on welding, and it's right. and there. It is create your own style, and then they show how they make these amazing websites that just fit in with their life. Whatever their space is in real life, they can have a website to go with it. They uh, are really yeah. beautiful commercials. I agree with you, Tom. Yeah, and it just goes right along with what we've been saying about Squarespace for years, which is they're beautiful. They have the beautiful, beautiful templates. We've seen their new soul. Ones. Yes, they're adding new templates all the time, new style options, and they can make even a schlub. I wouldn't want my personal desktop space to be shown on their ads. <laughs> that, would, that would convince people something wrong. Uh, but then, but maybe if you maybe it would work because maybe if you showed my messy desktop and then they show, showed my Squarespace site. And they could be like, look, you can be as messy as this guy in real life, but Squarespace is going to make you yeah. look good on the internet. You can you can lie to the public and make them think you're organized and beautiful when secretly you're hideous. That's what I love about Squarespace. <laughs> you could be hideous and lazy and nobody will know it. That's nobody right. Nobody will ever know. It goes back hey, to I've that got, old, you can be a dog on the internet and no one will know. <laughs> That's right. I've got, I've got my, my uh, Tuba Christmas uh, website on Squarespace. It works great. There you see it. Check it out. Tuba Christmas is is a great example. .com. is a great example of an inexpensive website. Just eight dollars a month is what it starts at. It includes a free domain name if you sign up for your mobile ready. If you go to tubachristmasla.com and look at it on your phone, it's going to look like Scott spent years designing it just for that <laughs> screen size. But then you go look Damn at a tablet, like how did he find the time? It looks great on the tablet. Now it looks great on the desktop, and it looks great. That's because Squarespace just does all that automatically. Mobile ready designs. Even their code is beautiful, Brian. Have you looked at their code? I, You know it's, what? I did once, but I was very ashamed of myself, and I apologized. I wrote them a letter the next day. I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I peeked, and I saw your code, and I felt very dirty. I was ashamed. But it was beautiful. Oh, my Wasn't God. It? it was beautiful. And Hosting plus is also, includes like, Squarespace takes I mean, care I, of that. I don't want to say... 
I don't want to say Squarespace wanted it, but like, I mean, I do know that you could customize their CSS. You can get right up in there and you can make whatever changes you want. So it's yeah. like, if, if you don't think it's beautiful, you can, you know, put on the gloves and get to work, sir. When you, That's all the I'm way their style sheets cascade, you can't help it. Start a trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use this offer code, framerate11. This one goes to 11. Get 10% off and show your support for Framerate. That's what we really want. We want you to thank Squarespace for their support of Framerate. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. And now we strip off our preconceptions and dive into the stream. So uh, Sandvine uh, put out their latest traffic report. They estimate how much traffic is happening on the internet at any given time. Used to be BitTorrent, right? Year after year, it was always like, eh, the P2P services, they're eating up all the traffic. Not anymore. Lately, the last few years, it's been Netflix. And what we found this year in the United States uh, is that Netflix has a new challenger. YouTube is up in the downstream anyway to 18.69% of all internet traffic, whereas Netflix is 31.62%. But you know what it tells me, Brian? People are watching what they want. Yeah, dude. Oh, wow. uh, look, we've said it before. Uh, convenience trumps fidelity. And the fact is, is if what you want is a high-quality Blu-ray, uh, for many properties, the only way to do it is in the black market of BitTorrent. Uh, but people are eschewing that for the convenience of a legitimate I mean, let's face it. This is what's great about Netflix is, is whether or not you take the morality of piracy out of it, Netflix is objectively faster, easier, and possibly even cheaper than piracy because you have you have no risk of of installing malware on your computer when you use Netflix. And uh, and you know, at eight bucks a month is so cheap that you know, you can get so much, and it's so fast. It's is faster and better, and and that, to me, that's that's wonderful. It means the good guys are winning, and that and that the the market is settling on the right, honest option here. And I'm very excited about that. I am too. I have to say, uh, I would rather do things legally than illegally. And uh, I am sad, Brian, at your comment, but I agree with it 100. percent The convenience trumps quality. Uh, in most cases, but I'm afraid it does, uh, certainly in the majority. But I watch Netflix all the time. Um, I don't watch YouTube that much, but uh, certainly Netflix. Um, and the, the convenience factor is fantastic, and I like not being a criminal. Now, what do but, you, but I'll well, tell you well, what. I think, I think we all. Well, like, both Netflix and YouTube are experiencing a real flight to quality lately. You know, YouTube, it's becoming increasingly common for you to have a 1080p option on YouTube to watch certain things. And certainly, mm. you know, uh, Netflix has even mentioned that they're going to be doing their version of a 4K offering uh, that's with their right. ultra yeah, high definition. So that's, that's exciting as well. And of course, Vimeo has already got the market cornered on, you know, when I think of high quality video that's stunning that I want to watch that's being streamed, it's almost always on, on a Vimeo site. So it's like, um, it, 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 I, I understand for somebody like you, who's a, a high-end user who always... Uh, you know, adores the highest fidelity experience. Uh, yeah. The good news is we're we're getting there. It's maybe not as fast as you'd like, and maybe not as directly as you'd like. But but first, you get the convenience, and then you have the flight to quality afterwards. It seems like. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I I do know that Netflix is is working on 4K. My only concern there is that it's going to be so compressed that that the Increase in quality will be negligible over high def. We'll see. I'm looking forward to checking it out. The other part of the quality oh, equation is the is the content, right? Is it something yeah. you want to watch? With Netflix, it's, well, true. it's one to one, right? Am I watching the Avengers in 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 Blu-ray? Am I watching Avengers on Netflix? I'm watching the same story, uh, and right. that's true for most of the stuff on there. But what about YouTube, Scott? I mean, you said yourself just now. I don't watch a lot of YouTube. Why do you think the creep up in numbers there. And we've we've actually got another story here from Tube Filter about the top 50 most channels if you kind of want to peruse that if you if you scroll oh, down. That, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. see that it's a it's a lot of a lot of music acts. There's a few YouTube stars like PewDiePie is number 2 worldwide. Remember this is worldwide. The number 1 right now is a Turkish music site uh which is which is actually incredibly popular, but it kind of surges and then and then goes back down. But most of this stuff you're looking at one Direction, Katy Perry, Eminem, Miley Cyrus, right? Big music names. But then it's 
PewDiePie doing his video games. It's Disney Collector being a, a, an open box of Disney collectibles. Uh, it's it's uh, the Fine Brothers on here. So it's Sky does Minecraft is number 17. What do, what do you think? I mean, is, does this mean that these kind of scrappy startup YouTube channel makers are going mainstream? Good question. PewDiePie. I haven't heard of most of this stuff, so I, I got to spend some more time on YouTube, clearly. <laughs> well, and that, that, well, okay. that's part, part if, of the if, thing there, right, Brian? If, if I may. Uh, um, you may. Uh, if, if I'm going to take a bird's eye view of everything, you know, different different platforms have different benefits. And if what you want to do is see an exquisite and beautiful stop motion animation or or independent film or whatever, go to Vimeo to watch that. If what you want to do is have a raw, unfiltered marketplace of ideas, oftentimes that's YouTube's strong suit because structurally it's so fast and easy to get your ideas and thoughts out there. And then you have these, you know, these thought leaders that are, you know, among the the the, the top 50 of uh, uh, YouTube channels. Uh, also notice that, that what, eight of the top 10 from what you said, Tom, it sounds like they're all music acts. And keep in mind, music acts are different from any other kind of video because you watch them again and again and again. Music acts are one of the few types of video that gets better the second, third, fourth, and fifth time that you watch them versus the first. Because the first, you're, you're, you're hearing the story told to you and you're learning the patterns of the music. And it's only you know, after after it's sat with you for a bit that you want to go back and visit visit it again. Um, so in, in many ways, I, I I personally tend to sort of discount all of the Vivo, all of the music-based stuff and just say that's the nature of music is that you want to watch it again and again and again compared to other stuff. Um, to me, what's more impressive is how many of the top 50 are people who are expressing their ideas, people who uh, are, you know, again, it sounds like such a freaking blow smoke up your butt term to say thought leader, but yes, they're thought leaders, you know, who are hmm. resonating with the public. And, and I think that's kind of rad. It's and, funny. And, you, what you said about music uh, videos kind of reminds, reminds me of what kids do with Disney movies. They watch them again and again and again and again. So music videos turn adults into kids, obviously. Uh, yeah, sure. And that, and that, I, that's I would agree be, with that. That's going to be a big <laughs> part of that 18% of, of the YouTube bandwidth that we're talking about from the Sandvine video. But look at PewDiePie with 42 million. Yeah, what network television show wouldn't die to have hmm. 42 million views in a week? Yeah. yeah. Keep in mind also, like That's nowadays, we live we live in a world, I was listening to uh, Dan Carlin's Common Sense podcast, which is amazing and everyone should listen to it. But at one point, he talks about how, uh, you know, um, Fox News crows about how the O'Reilly Factor gets 2 million views live every night or whatever. Like that's some kind of achievement. He points out, that a middling sitcom in the 80s, uh, like like the Golden Girls, on a bad night would have a eight to 11 million views, you know, four times larger. It's like this is this is the side effect of the diaspora of all the different the the the, the constantly fragmenting nature of the internet makes it possible for you to get ever increasingly specific content that's perfectly tailored to you. But the side effect is that it means that 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 getting those numbers, like 45 million or whatever, is increasingly difficult. And that's what makes these these YouTube channels all the more exceptional for having pulled it off. Yeah, and by the way, that con last common sense was an incredibly deceptive and clever use of the clip show con concept without having to oh. make you feel like oh, you're Oh, that's right. I wrote you into show. it. You're, you're, yeah. into, you're into Dan Carlin now. Dude, to that's total, awesome. total sideline. <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on to the tube tops. All right, so PS4 Day is coming up this Friday, November 22nd for $399.99 US anyway. UK has to wait till November 22nd and Japan has to wait even longer. Uh, but here in the US, we're getting it. And unlike the PS4, the Xbox One is not going to support 3D Blu-ray playback at launch. What? Now, Major Nelson, Larry right. Ribbs, said back in May that 3D playback would be cap that the Xbox One would be capable of it. But what they're saying now is, uh, they told CNET, we will not ship with 3D or 4K right. capability, but it could be added later. PS4 will ship with 3D Blu-ray capability as well as 3D game capability, even though there's not any 3D games. All right, so Scott is our expert on this, and I wanted to go to Scott for the, for the final word. But let me just say, as somebody who's sort of on the sidelines here, 
I didn't understand the importance either way when I first read this story. I'm like, who cares? Who has 3D TV or whatever, 3D Blu-ray or whatever? Um, but then the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it's not a case. Uh, eventually, I think a lot of hardcore gamers are going to end up buying both systems. I think most hardcore gamers end up being multi-platform. Uh, but you can only, most of us will only buy one right at release. And we have to choose between one or the other. And in that regard, this could be a blow. Not saying that 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 people will never buy this Xbox One or whatever, but like if what you want to do, if you have four hundred dollars in hand and you're either going to spend it on an Xbox One or a, uh, a PS4, this is the kind of thing that would make me decide which one to buy first and get around to buying the other one. Uh, and and so in that regard, I do think it's an important story. So what's your take, Scott? Um. Well, I agree with you. Uh, certainly having the capability is better than not having the capability. Uh, a lot of people say 3D, ho-hum, who cares? But most TVs that people buy these days have that capability. Whether or not they use it or not, it's there. So, uh, you know, having that capability in the gaming platform uh, is, is not a bad thing, in my opinion. There are people who enjoy 3D. I'm one of them. Leo's not, but there are plenty of people who are. And for them, having the PS3 be capable of 3D right out of the box is, is a, certainly a benefit. Also, 4K, uh, that's another story kind of altogether, which uh, I can get into if you want to spend the rest of the time on that. Well, but. <laughs> it's, a P, it's a PS4 with 3D Blu-ray capability Friday, but not 4K. And Xbox One won't have 4K either at launch. They both could have it down the road, but we can kick that can down the road safely for now because there ain't no content and the screens are way crazy expensive. But with Sony saying, yeah, we got we got 3D Blu-ray right out of the box, does that make the Sony PS4 the console to choose for the home theater geek, Scott? Unfortunately, the audio is breaking up and I can't hear you. Uh. Well, sorry. I will pretend that Scott says yes, Tom. That's a stupid question, <laughs> and there's no other option. Of course, it makes. I it heard that part. <laughs> of course, you heard that part. No, is that, so so the Sony PS4 becomes if you're going to pick a console, the home theater geek's choice. But absolutely, would it choose? Would you choose a PS4 though as a Blu-ray player? Well, I wouldn't because I'm not a gamer, and I I couldn't care less about video games, so I wouldn't. But if you are a video gamer, and I recognize how many of them there are out there, uh, I absolutely would choose a PS4 as a Blu-ray player. In fact, we just did a um, a uh, buying guide for Blu-ray players, our favorite Blu-ray players from AVS Forum. And the PS3, which is the current model, is one of them because it's a great Blu-ray player. And I'm sure the PS4 will be as well. So if you're a gamer and you enjoy watching movies on Blu-ray, it's a no-brainer. There's no other thing to get. That's the one but, to get. But I guess... What, what's curious to me, Scott, is that uh, of the two systems, the Xbox One is the one that's tried harder to focus on the secondary benefits, the non-gaming benefits of having an Xbox in the living room. They're the ones who have the whole like switch over to live television, immediately switch back to your game. They're the ones that have the whole connect base, recognizing who you are, what your preferences are, and go ahead and load up your favorite TV things that it's figured out you want. Whereas uh, PlayStation 4, its main focus has been on, no, 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 it's all about the games. It's all about the games. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised to hear that, that your pick would be, as a non-gamer, to go with the, the PlayStation 4. His call dropped. Oh, of yeah! course. Yeah! That's right. He's like, I'm out of here. Let's just play out the suspense a little, though. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was good. He uh, couldn't handle it. Can't handle the, the, the truth, can you, Wilkinson? For the cord cutters right. in the room, uh, you will, on the Sony PS4, you'll get Amazon Instant Video, you'll get Hulu Plus, you'll get Netflix, you'll get Vudu. You'll also get Crackle and Crunchyroll and Epix uh, and uh, Redbox and Yup TV, uh, as well as NBA and NHL. It does not say MLB, though. Does not say anything about the NFL, which of course Xbox has that big partnership with the NFL. So um, it's it's not a bad cord cutter device either, although it's missing YouTube. But all of these are missing something. All of them are missing yeah. one or two pieces. They never have everything. Uh, so that's coming out on Friday. Let's let's go ahead and move on to Film Found then. Yeah. We've got a date. 
for Star Wars Episode 7. Before we even have a name, December 2015, you will return to a galaxy far, far away. Uh, and it will be written by Lawrence Kasdan, uh, not uh, by Mr. Arndt. Uh, he's been let go from the writing. They said he was great, but J.J. Abrams, in an interview uh, with, uh, who was the, it was the interview with, it was a conference call, uh, the Slash Film had it, said, it became clear that given the time frame and the process and the way thing was going, that working with Larry in this way was going to get us where we need to be and when we need to be working. And he went on to say nice things about Michael R. And he's wonderful. We'd love to have him work on it uh, again in the future. But essentially the implication was he just works too slow and we, and we need, and Disney wants this out December 18th, 2015. So we, we need to get going. Well, and you could totally, if you read between the lines, you know, this boils down to somebody who probably believes in what he's doing, but was being yeah, somebody, uh, at, okay, so imagine you have this gig and you know you could do it, but you know it's going to take a little bit of time. You're working on it and Disney's just hammering you, hammering you, hammering you on the time. And finally, at some point, you decide to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, man, uh, if it's going to be something I want my name on, I ain't going to have the whole world hate me the way they hate Jar Jar Binks, you know, the way I saw what they did to George <laughs> Lucas. I'm not going to let that happen. I, I need time to get it done right. And then Disney made a call. You're like, you know what? Let's just get the guy who made uh, uh, Empire Strikes Back. And that's a total no harm, no foul. They don't mean anything bad by it. It's like, but the fact is, it's clear that Disney wants it in 2015. 2015 is going to be the greatest year to be a geek in major uh, cinema ever. And, uh, and, and so it, I'm, I'm going to call no harm, no foul on this. I'm okay with all this. Uh, and, and maybe it's the right call. Certainly, I'm excited to have Lawrence Kasdan in the mix for sure. And I'm excited to have a definite date in the mix, too. That's good. Scott, are you me worried too. about yeah, this me being too. rushed? Both, yeah, me too. No, counts. you're good. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I can't wait. Although I'm a little, I'm a little skeptical of J.J. Abrams. Um, after the second Star Trek movie, uh, I was disappointed in it. I know a lot oh, of people really, really liked what? it. Yeah, I really liked the second Star Trek movie. Also, you got a little bit uh, yeah. of noise on your line, by the way. I don't know if... Yeah, because, That's because right. you nothing change will devices. cooperate. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right. It's a haunted connection. Uh, all right, so we'll we'll get that reconnection with Scott Wilkinson. I will say though that uh, Star Trek Two, uh, I will admit that that it didn't resonate with me the way I had hoped it would. But they did make like pretty much all the right decisions. Like from objectively, I'm like, yes, this is what you should have done. I'm sorry that I still didn't care the way I was supposed to. Uh, what else we got, Tom? We got scan lines, Brian. That's what we got. Yeah. You know what? If we hold on with the uh, with the uh, blurred lines motif long enough, it'll, it'll be retro. So maybe we just oh sure. I think it's yeah. already retro. Congratulations, Shall we Tom. Kick off the clock. Yeah, uh, dude. Dish Do me a favor. Announced... Yes. Oh, I was gonna say gonna go kick first. Off the clock, but <laughs> but then, uh, but then yeah, you already right. did. Yeah. All right. So, Dish and... announced this morning that it will close. This morning being November sixth, that it will close down the remaining blockbuster. Brick and mortar retail locations. It's ending the company's DVD by mail rental service in December. Uh, they will keep the online version of Blockbuster going, both on the Dish service and, and online. Uh, but it's the end of an era, Brian. No more Blockbuster two, video. Wow. All right. Well, difference. two two things. First of all, to clarify, because I noticed that there was some backlash tweets about this. Uh, it did come out later that there's like, well, there are 50 franchisees and those 50 franchisees right. are still legally allowed to call themselves Blockbuster and you still owe them late fees. So don't try to get out of doing that. Uh, but second of all, like, you're right, man. What a remarkable change. What a, what a different world. I mean, Blockbuster was the dominant force when when I was in my early 20s. I'm old. Also, CEO Reed Hastings of Netflix on Facebook linked to a 2005 Market Watch story saying Netflix would uh, should is underestimating Blockbuster's market position. I'm going to use my extension. I never do that. Uh, and he said, oh, well, no one is right all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, it should be pointed out that in that article, the Market Watch said uh, my, Michael Prechter put a $3 price target on Netflix. He was only off by two orders of magnitude. So you can't fault him. He almost solved it as a Fermi problem. Uh, wow, that yeah, was right. high-minded uh, physics that I just dropped. <laughs> oh. No, I'm not going to miss Blockbuster at all. I was amazed that at its height, it had over 9,000 stores. And now they're talking about closing the last 300. 
Yeah. So it's a tremendous, at. tremendous drop off. And I've always just attributed it to, you know, the rise of online streaming. Uh, but a lot of people uh, claim that Redbox is another important factor. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's yes. True. Without, without you can still doubt. get uh, physical another, media. Uh, what's not a factor yet, but probably will be, Tom Merritt, I need you to explain to me why Stream Nation is not going to be shut down instantly. Because I saw you going to Twitter some people were saying, like, I give it 20 minutes until it gets, uh, you know, aerioed or, or yeah, uh, very clever uh, here. Uh, two, two things. Two things, real quickly. One is you're not storing anything when you share them because the big deal with Stream Nation is you store your stuff on your own server and friends can stream it, not download it. And only one person can stream from you at a time. So it's not widespread sharing. It's not like a mega upload or a file distribution service. So they've got a different tactic. Right, it may, it may not. Well, help and, and to and to explain for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Stream Nation is a service that allows you to store your video. You could rip your DVDs to their cloud-based storage, and so it's it's your locker. Well, no, 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 it's no, 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 your no, no. Content. They don't say anything Wait, oh, about no. ripping DVDs, Brian. They say what you can take your undrm'd movies and TV shows and store them there. How they got oh. under you? They don't know. Because otherwise, it'd be inducement. Okay. Man, and it would be illegal. Uh, I don't know. Now I am curious to how that's going to go. You kind of unconvinced me at the end. What else you got, man? <laughs> NPD Display Search Analyst Paul Gagnon claims on Monday, that's today, in a research note that Apple won't be gearing up for a TV now until 2015. Uh, he had been expecting a product in 2014, but he says content deals are ripping it apart. They're going to focus on wearables now. Apple's shifting priorities because they just can't figure out how to deliver the freaking shows to the product that they've had figured out for two years now. Man, this, Boy, I gotta, is, this is... Oh, oh go, no, go ahead, Scott. Share that. I, I was just going to say, um, the, the previous rumor was, as you pointed out, that Apple TV, Apple was going to make a TV by the end of 2014 and that it was going to be a 65-inch UHD or 4K misnomer for $1,500 to $2,500 bucks. Now, 65 inches are in the five grand range right now, so, or more. So I didn't right, see I how they were my possibly going to do that. I, I want to use my extension just to keep him talking, keep talking about this, because I'll tell you this much. I had not, uh, like to me, the benefit of an Apple TV had always been in the ease of the interface and the solving of the marketplace dilemma. But you just brought in a new element that I hadn't previously considered, that the hardware itself could be revolutionary at a price uh, that that I hadn't previously considered. If right, but, they I, but had, I find that even, to be di even, difficult to... Sorry, go ahead. Well, well I was going to say, like, even, if, even at $2,000 for a 4K display with a built-in Apple interface, uh, I, I think I would jump on that super fast and not even for its intended pur purpose. <laughs> well, I don't see how Apple could do it. First of all, Apple's got a history of being relatively expensive for what they what they produce. And it's really good stuff and high quality and all that stuff, but it's expensive. So how they could come up with a TV that was so much less than, than my, the my big is, giant manufacturers, I don't know how. The first one would not have been 4K. It would have just been high resolution. And the, con the convincing aspect would have been the interface and the content. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so Facebook is adding reminders for TV shows and uh, uh, airings to its Android app. I think it's curious that it's the Android app and not everything all the way across. But I guess uh, Facebook, it knows what you like. Might as well remind you that your favorite show is coming back on. Uh, you for it or against it? Nobody? Gentlemen? I Because I don't know where they <laughs> I mean, they're, they're on Android because it's 80 percent of the marketplace, and they want to gather this data together. That's that they're trying to be they're trying to beat Twitter at this game of partnering up with television shows. It's nifty to have something that's going to remind me, but I don't want to be locked into Facebook. So my objection to it is more about not wanting to use Facebook than not wanting a reminder service. I use Google now for my reminder service, actually. And I'm not even on Android, so it doesn't matter to me one whit. And you so look a lot you. more intense, Scott, with your when yeah, like Skype your camera is zoomed in something. automatically, and it's like it looks like, uh, like Skype just, is just not my friend today. I'm no, sorry. it's great. It's it's good. Everything's great. All right, what what else <laughs> we got, Tom? <laughs> Cultura is a company that provides universities, enterprise uh, level companies, media companies, a platform to deliver video. Now, previously, all they did was say, hey, we'll give you a player and a content management system. You encode your video and put it up there and, and take care of the rest of it. But now they've got a new product called MediaGo aimed at media partners who just want to take their video, put it up and have it 
automatically coded, automatically delivered. It, they're calling it Netflix in a box on TechCrunch. So essentially, what this could do is take the production companies who are like, I don't know anything about the web, and say, but I've got my video. And all they would have to do is upload their video and sell it or rent it or stream it directly to the customer. Man, this is going to be very weird for you to hear me say, because I'm normally somebody in charge, you know, always shouting rah, rah for fragmentation. But it's like, I want, as a consumer, I want less fragmentation. I don't want to have to get an account on another. All of a sudden, every podunk, five and dime media company has its own service. I have to sign up. Oh, I don't want to sign up on all the services. I just want, just sell it to Netflix, please. Make it easy for me. Your turn. I agree. <laughs> All right. Uh, I thought that, sign, oh, yeah. that's what that sound meant. That was it. Yeah, we, we, we talked about, uh, I didn't realize that it was me again. Uh, we talked previously about how Amazon is doing a lot of its piloting process kind of in public. But we found out from a story on All Things D, Peter Kafka reports, that Amazon has started a semi-secret digital focus group for its homegrown TV shows and movies. Now, of course, you can't be a member of anything having anything to do with the press uh, but if you're an average Joe, a few select people are being invited into the program where we assume their feedback is going to determine which of these, um, uh, you know, which of these movies go beyond or television shows go beyond the pilot phase. Uh, it's it's smart for them to try to to do two prongs on this. Right, Tom? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it, it's it's interesting that it, they're learning from their experience, I think, that, oh, just crowdsourcing doesn't always get you the best results. They need a little more detailed information. But they, they run the risk of focus groups everywhere and overvaluing an unrepresentative sample. Yeah, agreed. Sorry, Scott, nobody cares what you have to say because we're out of time. But we have to check in on the movie draft. Yeah, winter's not coming. Here. Well, it's kind of here. Boy, winter really came for Jeff Kanata. Book Thief got $108,000. That was limited release, though, so don't, don't <laughs> take that too hard, Jeff. Uh, but Thor the Dark World, Father Robert Balasser's movie, got $85 million, putting him right up there at number four, kind of launching him in there because it was his first move. Yeah, okay, on the one hand, yes, that's not bad for an opening weekend, but you figure uh, that means it's going to round out at maybe just shy of $200 million. Twice Ender's Game. If it does well. Um, Is it twice, okay. Was it twice as like, much? I like, didn't know what Ender's Game yeah. did. 44 yeah, million Tom, for Ender's Game so know. far. You and I are dead men walking. We already know oh, this. Yeah. This is fine. No. It's, it's okay. It's the race but to the, the bottom. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who's <laughs> feeling better right before he dies because I'm in third place right now because I, Ender's Game just came out. Uh, but I'm yes, about to exactly. collapse again. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, man. I think Casey is in a better position than I ever dared believe. Like, even just last week, I was crowing about how Father Robert's going to take it. But now I, I don't even know. I, I, I got nothing here. Who would have thunk $231 million for gravity? Incredible. Yeah. Nope. Well done. Not, none of us. None of us. Well done. Every, well, Casey McKinnon, that's who would have thunk. Uh, uh, I, yes. thought it was, uh, I thought it was a great right. movie. By the way, somebody in the chat room said, gravity was not in 3D, right? No, no, no. Gravity oh, yes, is in 3D. We've talked about that. It's fabulous in 3D. Yeah. <laughs> now, Absolutely. here's the thing. We have another player. Justin Robert Young beat me because he had more money. He spent a record-breaking in the history of the draft. I don't think anyone spent $74 on a movie before. Justin did it for The Hunger Games Catching Fire, which does look like it's going to freaking explode. The last Hunger Games did, like, what, over $400 million or something ridiculous? Yeah, uh, that's going to launch him at right least strategy. into contention with Casey, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, in fact... I wouldn't be surprised if two weeks from now, Justin was ahead of Casey. And then Casey yeah. to overtook him again. And then I came yeah, in last. It, it might, might be neck and neck, depending on Hunger Games. I think Hunger Games is going to do very well. I also think I folks should really give Delivery Man a chance. It looks funny. <laughs> you need a laugh in these trying times. Head out to the theaters this weekend and give it a shot. Why not? Or just buy a ticket uh, and support it. Well, full, full disclosure, full disclosure. Oh, who, who, who owns Delivery Man? Uh, let me look. Oh, oh, it's mine. Oh, oh what, a, what a surprise. Ah, that's, that? that's, yeah. that's why I just think it's a fantastically I, I funny. Think, and I think it's time guy for us to talk about what we're watching. What we're watching. Well, Scott Wilkinson, we know you saw Ender's Game and we have failed you by neither one of us seeing oh, it. Oh, man. Uh, 
But well, unfortunately, it's one reason why I suspect it probably didn't do so well is that it's more thoughtful than most uh, sci-fi movies. You know, I was really afraid that it would, Hollywood was just going to make it into a giant shoot 'em up and 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 have nothing of the depth that Orson Scott Card put in the novel that it's based on. But they they actually retained some of that depth. I was very surprised and said, "Oh well, that must mean it's not going to do very well." <laughs> And I guess it did okay. It has done okay it did, it so did, far. It did all right, but it certainly wasn't as blockbuster as Gravity or, or as we expect the Hunger Games or even Thor. Uh, yeah, no, exactly right. I do recommend Ender's Game, particularly if you've, if you've read the book. It's, it's, it really retains a lot of the, of the depth, as I said, the complexity, the ethical dilemmas. Um, the guy who plays Ender, the kid, it was the guy who played Hugo several years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, now, sure. Now he's grown up a bit and is more of a teenager type, but um, I still think he does a good job. Harrison Ford is Harrison Ford. He always does what he does. Ben Kingsley, I thought was very good. Um, the And what was interesting one, for me, one of the real interesting things was that the director, Gavin Hood, decided specifically not to do it in 3D. There were some shots that I, when I saw it, I went, wow, that would look great in 3D. Uh, Hood said, no, the, the long shots in space would look really cheesy. And he used a lot of long lenses to try and Im impart some emotional uh, depth to it. And he said, those don't look very good in 3D. So I decided not to do it in 3D. You can't see it in 3D because he didn't do any of, the, any of it in 3D, uh, which was an artistic decision. And I respect him for that. I'll tell you what, man, I'd hate to be the guy who paid a lot of money for Ender's Game and the movie draft, considering that it wasn't there to benefit from the three. Who uh, who bought who bought Ender's Game in the movie draft? Tom? Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Tom. That was the stupidest thing I've ever done in the in any any probably in any kind of game where I was like, ha, everybody's gonna want Ender's Game. And y'all are like, you're opening at 30? You can have it crazy man <laughs> it was it was it was actually pretty awesome it's a I'm great really cool. movie yeah, i still recommend that people see it it's it's really good uh, uh i went to see thor the dark world last night i was at blizzcon this weekend so i didn't watch a lot of tv shows i'm still catching up on father ted on hulu but i really enjoyed thor the dark world i thought it was a thrill ride it had a little funny element to it they had some not it, it was at this point what you could call a classic marvel studios comic book hero movie with all the elements. It's, it's satisfied on all points. How did it compare to uh, the original Thor? I thought it was better, honestly. Yeah. And, and maybe because I saw the original Thor, I like this one. I don't know if you went into it cold, whether it would, would be as enjoyable because you don't know the characters as well. Uh, but yeah, it just, it, it, it kept me guessing at a couple of points and, and it was tightly edited. It never dragged. Uh, the plot was a comic book plot, but it was a good plot and it kept, kept me focused and, and into it. Uh, so I, I I I think it was a solid base hit or a double of a movie, and and I highly recommend it. Then I'll Wait, go. When's the last time Marvel had a bomb like a like a truly bad yeah, movie? Good question. Like, do you have to do you have to go back to like Daredevil or or, or the uh, Hulk? The the Ed Norton Hulk. See, see, and I even liked the Ed Norton Hulk, but uh, is that the but one again, by I mean, I'm a sucker for all of that stuff. Uh, no, 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 that's the original. Uh, which, and oh. to be honest, I like that one too. So I'm probably not a very good judge. Uh, <laughs> I like the uh, Ang hey Lee man. one. So, uh, Tom, I know we had talked about me getting all caught up on The Walking Dead and having a giant um, spoiler zone today. Here, mm -hmm. Here's the thing about plans is sometimes you have them and on paper <laughs> they look brilliant. And then, uh, and then before you go to bed on Sunday night, your, your assistant Brant says, Hey, so uh, we're going to that show that you have at noon in San Antonio tomorrow, right? Mm. And you find yourself typing, we have a show tomorrow at noon in San Antonio? I forgot all about that. And then your whole plan of like watching a marathon of four, five episodes straight in a row and talking about them on the spoiler zone. It kind of just all craters, sort of Balls center apart. doesn't hold. Mm. And then, then you're eating fire at a oh. San Antonio college. And then, then oh, you come well. on frame rate and you have to explain about how <laughs> you promised a thing and you're not delivering it. Maybe it's just me. But uh, you know what? You Could, relate, I think Brian Brushwood has been very brave to share that with us. And I want to give him, everybody, come on, give him a round of applause for, for me. 
<laughs> I am so sorry. I am so sorry. In my mind, it was a brilliant plan. And it was all going to work out. But in my defense, uh, here's one of the things about watching The Walking Dead is I cannot watch it during daylight hours because I can't have the kids coming in while I watch it, which makes it difficult. So it's like my whole plan was kids are around all weekend. We got birthday parties and all that stuff that we're doing. My plan was uh, I need to do this uh, this this tax stuff, which is not mentally taxing. It's just, you know, moving numbers into categories so so I can enjoy watching television while I'm doing it. And I was going to do it all day today. And then turns out I had a show and I was so irresponsible that I almost forgot about it. And so now did, I, I noticed you got here. the Stanley parable written down in here, though. Did you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, I do. Actually, I, I played through the Stanley parable on the live stream, I think back on Thursday. Um, it's extraordinary. It was utterly amazing it was a a a um i i can't tell you anything about it for fear of taking away from the magic it's it's a probably a 90 minute experience for you to get the bulk out of it it's only $14.99 it's a little indie title available on steam if you like games i think you will adore the experience because it mm -hmm. was it was utterly magical and i and i can't i i will not tell you anything more beyond that cuz i want you to enjoy it but if you're too cheap to spend $14.99, you could get a similar experience if you play the Flash-based video game Frog Fractions. Uh, just Google <laughs> Frog Fractions, and it will, you will look at it, and you're like, why is Brian recommending this? And I'm saying, trust me. Trust me and stick with it and go as far as you can. And it's we'll not just a see. math learning game, Frog Fractions? Um. Well, according to the description on the site here, you know what? I'll even show you. I'm going to go. I'm gonna type up Frog Fractions. So is games.com? Uh, twinbeard.com right slash frog dash fractions. Hang on here. Look at this. I'm going to, I'm going to just give you a little, little, little teaser. This is what it looks like. So this is, yeah, twin, it. It, 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 you click it's frag frog, frog fractions, revolutionary, the best way to teach your child about fractions. And look here, look, I'm going to learn about fractions. There, there's some fractions. So the same as the Stanley parable. Got it. Um, now I don't want to play the Stanley much. parable anymore. Well, you will after you play Frog Fractions because they both have the same. Look at all these fractions. There's a lot of fractions I'm getting right now. So many fractions. A lot. Well, ladies and it's, gentlemen, uh, I think uh, if we've learned anything <laughs> over the past month here at Frame Rate, we have learned that when you cut the cord, as Brian Brushwood did this year, you end up playing video games. <laughs> apparently, apparently that's the case. I am so sorry, Tom. I wanted to do right by you, but I ended up playing the Stanley Parable and putting off watching The Walking Dead next week. For reals, next week. I mean it. Can we just yeah. move on to feedback? <laughs> Let's do. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know what we got, Brian? What? You know what we got? We got an email. What? Wait, 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 but it's, it's, it's email, something that you and I email? are best, like, 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 it's something that you and I are best to answer, right? Like, like, you and I need to be the ones to answer this. Or this Scott could weigh in too, possibly. Wait, well, you know? Scott? It's an electronic right. mail. Ooh, Ooh, let, me? let me hear this email. Yeah. Yeah, well, here's the here, here's what it says. Robert says, hey, guys, I have listened to the show probably since the beginning and feel like you forget about, oh, this is the one we read last week. He, by the way, he wrote back as like, I wasn't trying to be snarky. I really wasn't. Uh, I cut the cord years ago and moved to Comcast business because I was afraid of the caps that everybody was talking about. So you can see that I watch plenty of streamed content and most of it looks good, but it's not in the realm of good Blu-ray. I'm one of those guys that buys nice stuff and takes the time to set it up properly and I really enjoy the results. My I also kind of sit guy. close enough to my TV that when 4K becomes viable, I will be all over it. Oh, uh, man. For me, I am happy to wait for a season of TV like Game of Thrones to come out on Blu-ray. Sure, I'm always behind, but I don't like a show less because I had to wait a year. I also pay for the Blu-rays from Netflix, which I hope does not die off anytime soon. As soon as streaming can deliver the same quality picture and sound as a Blu-ray, I'll be all over it. Until then, I want those discs to keep coming. Man after my so, own heart. Uh, yeah, we we saved this for you, Scott, because, of course, that's what your whole show is about, is about fidelity over... We're all about convenience on frame rate, and you're all about right. fidelity on home theater yep. geeks, right? That's so, right. So what advice there do you, you have? That. What what words of wisdom do you have for them? Well, unfortunately, the uh, Blu-rays from Netflix are about to stop, <laughs> as we talked about <laughs> earlier on this show. You know, that's unfortunate. 
Um, he sits close enough to his TV that when 4K becomes uh, available or viable, he will be all over it. That's that's sitting probably actually too close for Blu-ray <laughs> or for 1080p. So, <laughs> right, right. You're probably right. Yeah, huh? I, I would say be careful there a little bit. Um, but I'm I'm totally with him, you know. Uh, I would rather see quality over convenience. Now, that isn't to say that I don't watch Netflix or other streaming when I don't care as much about the quality. But when I'm going to sit down and really get into a movie... I want the Blu-ray, and uh, so I'm with Robert for sure. Right on, man. We also have an email from Carter, who uh, is in Boulder, Colorado. It says, hey, Frame Raiders, I just started my Aereo trial in the Denver market, and I must admit I'm very impressed with the quality of the service. For $12 a month, I can record two channels while watching two simultaneously, Which to which I say that's a lot of watching all at once. And while Denver's no broadcast kidding. universe is nowhere near as packed as with channels in New York or Chicago's, I was very surprised to discover channels available on Aereo that were not available on the air, uh, over the air antenna to my own residents. Plus, Bloomberg Business News looks sharper and functions better on Aereo than on Bloomberg's own Roku channel. Aereo works on my Roku 2 and 3 as well as my Nexus 7 and HTPC for a quality second room tuner. It probably even justifies the entry point cost of $8 per month. My old Comcast Lifeline service costs around $24 per month for even fewer broadcast channels. Now, if Aereo could just link to municipal government broadcasts, all my needs would be met for Lifeline TV. On Roku, <laughs> it sounds uh, or it rounds out a cord cutter's knees. Keep up the good work, blah, 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 blah. We're great. Um, thank you very much, Carter. Uh, appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, good stuff. Thanks, Carter. I want to skip down to Alex because I want to answer this. Uh, I know, Tom, that you're an early adopter of Simple.TV, he writes. I'm not talking to myself. And says, I recall you giving it a so-so review on first release, which was understandable for new. I noticed that there was a big update recently. And as some time has passed, I was wondering if you could give us an updated review. I'm a regular viewer and don't recall the update being mentioned. If it has, and you can direct me to the episode, this is the episode right now. Uh, I just, I made sure I was up to date I went and updated it before the show, and I have to say, with the update, the video quality has improved markedly. It now looks almost as good as it does on my television. Before, it was definitely degraded uh, somewhere along the line, even though it was still HD. It was like, this is not what it looks like when it comes straight over the air into my set. Now, it looks a whole lot closer. There is some artifacting every once in a while, but I think that is as much a result of my antenna as it might be of, of the connection. But it still takes forever to tune. Uh, and I've got the original Simple TV from the Kickstarter. So new versions that they sell may be a little faster. I don't know. Uh, but it the problem with Simple.TV is, is that it does what you want it to do. But even on the Roku app, it just takes forever. to You can't switch between channels. You have to know what you want to watch. And it's going to take you a few minutes to get to it. It's not a very convenient app even still. But, but definitely the quality of the video has improved. Right on. Uh, dude, I guess that's it. We're, we're kind of running long right now, so I guess we've got to wrap things up. I guess uh, if you guys want to comment, go ahead and hit us up at framerate at twit.tv. I read all of those, and I try to respond. If you get like a one-word or one-line response, just understand I've got 30 of them to go through on a Monday afternoon, and I just want you to know that I definitely read it and appreciate it. So it's like somebody will write eight paragraphs, and I'll be like, ha ha, Brian, <laughs> is the response <laughs> that I'm able to send. And then I see all the ones Brian responds to, and I read those, yes. and then I silently <laughs> nod my assent. Just so you know. That's about right. That seems about right. <laughs> Scott, uh, welcome dude, to uh, that. Where can people Thank see you. you, Scott? Hey, great to see you guys, too. Where can so, uh, uh, people yeah. find uh, the home theater geeks and, and the things you're doing online and all that good stuff? Oh, sure. Well, Home Theater Geeks, of course, is on uh, our own network here, twit.tv slash HTG. And on YouTube, I do watch that. <laughs> at uh, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks and you can find me my primary online home is avsforum.com where i am there all the time <laughs> day and Excellent. night uh, hey tom before we wrap up can i plug one thing that's not related to frame rate at all all right um sure. Tonight at midnight, you guys know that that we uh, we offer uh, scamstuff.com is all the clever stuff that goes with like the stuff that we teach on Scam School. We've been shut down for three days to build up for our big holiday uh, thing. Uh, we're doing a huge sale where every single item in the store is on sale. Some as high uh, or everything. Th there's one package where you could buy everything at the store for over 55% off. Like, like, like just uh, deep, deep discounts for everything. Uh, really excited about it. The idea is 
you know, let's say you got a bunch of like like five casual friends and you want to give them something that that shows that you care. So we're doing like a five pack of scam school books and I'll sign all of those for you and um uh you know for 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 like fifty dollar discount or something ridiculous. Anyway, scamstuff.com tonight at midnight. That goes live. It's a 48 hour sale. I'm I'm getting a jump on the whole like Black Friday or Cyber Monday thing by starting a whole month earlier. Yeah, because I have scam to scam Tuesday, I'm... ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, <laughs> scam Tuesday. I like that. That's good. <laughs> uh, don't forget about our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash rate. and of course you can find our podcast links to show notes, all this other great information at twittv fr. As Brian mentioned, you can email us. Our email address is framerate at twit.tv. You can find us live if you want to watch and chat along with us in the chat room, 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time at twit.tv. That's live.twit.tv. We will see you next time. That's a lot. You'll see us. <laughs>